Welcome everybody. All right. I want to uh, say welcome everybody at DPDK. It's great to have you all here for this uh, first ever meetup organized by DPDK at DPDK. That's a very special uh, evening for us. Last month we did actually uh, host a meetup, a special PHP uh, meetup, which was uh, crowded with lo a lot of more guys with long hair and metal uh, shirts. So that's a different crowd uh, <laughs> sitting in front of me. But that's, that's fun because we are actually we're uh, kind of uh, yeah, uh, inspired by that meeting because we thought, okay, it's pretty cool to, to host a meeting and not only for development, but also for other uh, disciplines we have. So now we have for design and next month we actually have a new meetup about creative coding and motion because that's pretty cool, uh, pretty cool subject for, uh, for next month. And that's not the end because stay tuned, next year we will have an, a new uh, series of, uh, of meetups. So follow us and make sure you don't miss any of them because it's uh, going to be more awesome every time. It's going to be awesome, awesome every time. Don't judge about uh, what's, which one is better. <laughs> Bad plan. Uh, it's also cool because uh, a few years ago we were also uh, uh, kind of a sponsor of the Adobe User Group Meetup. We had a tight connection with them and we actually uh, had a few presentations uh, uh, together with them, not at DPDK but at some uh, other location in Rotterdam or Amsterdam. And uh, now we're back in the meetup scene and we like to, uh, actually we love to new meet new people, see new people and make sure we have, uh, we create a great space for people to come over, have a nice barbecue. So thanks uh, for all the burgers guys, it uh, was great Woo! again. <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone likes it and uh, it's very enthusiastic to come back next month because that uh, will be very, uh, very nice. Uh, for tonight we have, uh, we had three speakers. Uh, unfortunately, Daniel uh, called in sick, so we talk about, uh, uh, especially his cases from KLM and Porsche will uh, not be held today, but he promised, Anouk, he will come next month, li right? Okay, we will uh, make sure he, he gets that note. Um, as a first speaker, uh, we will have uh, Brian James, who will talk about his uh, award-winning project. I'm not going to spo spoil too much, but he can uh, tell everything about it. And after that, we'll have our own Anouk. We will talk about the art of art direction and she will tell you everything about that and uh, we have a short break in between so you can actually go to the toilet or take a small drink. And after that I hope you can uh, join each other again on the roof terrace to enjoy the summer evening with a lot of uh, drinks and a uh, good vibe. So I would uh, really enjoy and love, uh, love to see that. So I would say enjoy this evening and uh, give it up for uh, Brian James. Thank you very much for DPDK uh, for having me tonight. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say in advance, this is my uh, first ever talk, and therefore um, I don't know if you guys have been to conferences before um, and seen like amazing talks where people are like really professional and the slides are, like super glossy. Like, just don't expect that, okay? Like, this is gonna be terrible. This is basically my, me like destroy my career in a 30-minute or less period of time or more. Um, so just yeah, uh, like when you when you're talking about like amazing night, just, just 
manage expectations, as project managers like to say all the time. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, so just a brief introduction. I'm, I'm Brian. Um, I'm an interactive designer and developer. Um, and basically, <coughs> pardon me, um, over the years, um, I've been doing mainly design originally, um, and then moving more into interactive, like, we, we, like we're all doing. Um, and over time have moved gradually into the code side of things um, just as a, a natural progression and what my uh, talk tonight is going to be about is basically how um, how my path progressed into using really uh, uh, experimental code um, and I'm going to speak mainly about a project that I've done but how you can use the approach that I used in the project um, in other projects because if you talk just about a project that you've done what do you learn from that um, I think the approach itself is maybe unique in what people are doing and I think that there's something to be said about using this approach and it's yeah it's basically going to be about how you can use this approach this experimentalism to uh, yeah make very unique uh, digital projects so the first thing I'd like to say is that um, I know you're probably looking at me and thinking who is this 12 year old boy just like talking in front of us like where do you get this guy what the hell um, I'm 30 years old um, which is uh, one of the themes of my talk today is how terrible being fucking old is <laughs> and the fact that like after your mid after maybe your early 20s you just get used to everything like you've already experienced everything in your life you've already eaten all the kind of good food to a point where nothing's really a surprise anymore and um, that's why being 30 is quite shit but, but um, the other thing that I've noticed is, even though I still look fairly young, which is a good thing, my body, however, is doing something very, very different. <laughs> <laughs> Strange coincidence of being 30, but, <laughs> but um, that's just how I'm evolving as, a, as an interactive developer. Um, but uh, <clears throat> essentially, what, uh, one of the main themes that I'm talking today about is experimentation and how, um, basically, Experimentation is so key in everything that we do, and it can be used to. Uh, later on, I'll later on I'll, I'll get onto the main points that experimenting can really connect to a human being in a way that normally experimentation sounds dangerous, and it's very developer focused. Um, and I actually think it can reach a human being in a very unique way. Um, and I'll start off with the fact that the importance of experimentation in youngsters or young designers is super, super important. Like one of the things I really hate seeing. Um, in a young designer, and I see this quite often, is where, okay, so there's like product websites where a lot of the American startups are doing this, um, where you'll have a young designer who is doing an amazing job for what they do, but it's not, experiment it's not experimenting, it's not like getting their mind and expanding into the areas that they need to be doing, because for me, like, when can, when can you experiment as a designer? I think it is when you're young. Um, when you're older, you need to have much more responsibility, um, and for me, like, yeah, I've seen a lot of times where a young designer is just completely within their shell. So for me, it's always really important that young designers are experimenting. Um, and I'm going to go into how that's a difficulty for especially young designers to convince people. And I'd just like to take you on a little path of how I was originally experimenting that took me onto the path of the kind of coding experimentation that I'm doing uh, like these days and did for my main project. Um, so in my early, early years, um, I, I didn't mention directly earlier on, but I was originally like a, like a visual designer only, like not interactive, but rather print, infographics, things like that. And my kind of experimentation that I was doing at the time was <laughs> <laughs> mainly around ideas. Um, like, just focus on the right-hand side here. I don't, I don't know, the other side is like nonsense. But if this was an infographic about uh, STDs, <laughs> sexually transmitted diseases, and... Um, I just liked playing. Like, I can't do this now. Like, th that can't happen now, because I'm, like, uh, you, if you're in a company, you're a senior or, like, you know, lead interactive designer. You can't stick a cock on an infographic and expect it to, and especially with whatever it's, well, what it's doing. It's doing its thing with the statistic there. <laughs> but I, I, my point here was the fact that, like, I think it's very important not just to experiment with styles, but rather with ideas. Um, and... I, I personally think that when you're that young, this is the time when you need to like try all of the different things that you that you can do, so that later on, when the project lands on your table and it's a 200k project, you know the exact thing that you can do because you've tried so many things. And to me, a, a, like a, a young designer who's stayed within one area isn't going to know how to answer that question because they haven't they haven't tried enough. So anyway, back to back to my path. Um, like I say, it was mainly visual design at the, at the time, and then <laughs> and these are real pieces of work. I haven't just like Googled penis graphics 
and stuff like that. This was, this was a piece of work that I did um, about four years ago called the penis manual. Never went live, killed me. Just, yeah, <laughs> surprised I'm not dead from hanging myself because of how like, really kind of disappointed I was that it never went live. But, uh, but again, it was about, okay, okay, it's a penis. But like, at the time I was really throwing ideas out there. And to me, to me at the time, um, there was something in such like being out there with ideas that for me was going to create an impact. I just felt it inside me. Um, but the problem is that art directionally, you can never, it's very, I think as an art direction or design perspective, it's very hard to, to do something that actually hits a, per, hits a human being because does anyone really, does anyone really care? So my, my um, oh sorry, it's another slide, just a little deep dive there. You, you can see a cross section of, of, of what's going on. It was very analytical, okay? But you can see I was like exploring lots of different styles and, and that's the main point from that. Um, so I, be, I began at that time experimenting with um, code stuff. Um, what my struggle with that kind of work was that it was cool to me. I wanted to do it for my portfolio. I wanted to do it because I felt that there was something that would hit a human being because it's new, but it doesn't because nobody cares. Um, and to me, yeah, ma making new stuff was so difficult. You'll, you'll, like, that, that kind of visual stuff, people have seen it before. It's a past piece of, of what's been done before, which is what got me into code-based experimentation because um, what, I'd, what I would essentially, what I started doing at this point, which I've kept doing now, is taking a small new piece of CSS or, <clears throat> you know, it can be something like Canvas. I'm not, per I'm not personally doing things like Canvas or WebGL, but like taking little things that have just come onto the scene and like placing them at the core of a project. Um, this is what I started doing at that point because I was struggling with the fact that I was experimenting a lot without any results because like I say, nobody cares really about what something looks like when you're talking about a human being at the, other, at the other end. I'll take you through a couple of projects that I worked on at the time. Um, bear with me. Uh, So, um, sorry, two seconds. <laughs> so the first one was one called Hashima Island. This is from three years ago, um, and it was just a, it was just a personal project about basically an, an island off the uh, off the coast of Japan, um, which is basically deserted. And Google did this street view photography, which was amazing. It was I'll, I'll, I'll quickly just slide it through as I talk. Um, <coughs> they street viewed the island, and it's a deserted island that Mitsubishi once owned. And the street view photography is amazing because it just shows these real, like, ruined places. And the original Google Street View stuff is all in color. You can just go around. But my question was like, okay, well, w what is this place? That I want to know something about this place. So I just created a project that was essentially taking you through different parts of this island. Oops, what's happened there? <laughs> um, I'm just giving you information about the actual place itself, giving you some context around the Google Street View, um, f like photography. But the main thing I want to point out here in this, pers in this particular project in, in terms of the CSS experimental stuff is the fact that I turned Google Street View black and white. Now, I think now, three years later, a lot of different things have been done with uh, Street View. Like, I think there's one with a forest. I don't know if you've seen that, where there's someone's like placed jungle around and Lego, of, uh, people have turned it into Lego and stuff. But at the time, turning Google, Google Street View with one line of CSS code, black and white, I think that was like, for me, people would look at that and go, ooh, that's cool. Wow, cool. You know, and um, you can, you can kind of go around the island, find out, find out actual contextual information about it. But the key thing for me was that you were taking Google Street View and turning it black and white with a simple line of code, which, I don't know, contextually, have people seen that before? No. Um, and the project did quite well. And I'll take you on to a second project at the time. Just to, it's just giving you an idea of the kind of little things that I was experimenting with like early on in terms of little snippets of code and driving them into the core of a project um, to the point where it's almost the entire point of the project and then the entire thing is built around this little experimental code that you've chosen to use in a weird way. There was another one at the time. Oh, sorry, I didn't actually mention. The code used in that one is just WebKit filter. The devs in here will be like, yeah, it's like four years old, don't care. But like at the time, I think WebKit filters just hadn't been used in a creative way. And I think, um, yeah, getting, yeah, I'll, I'll go get onto that stuff about the, the fact that if you use something that's just on the scene in a creative way, 
before other people do it. I think it's, it's quite easy to do it. This was another one that used WebKit filters. WebKit filters basically take uh, the hue that you can, like, between black and white or different color hues, as, just as you have in Photoshop, um, and play about with them using simple CSS animation. Again, this was a three-year-old, actually, no, two-and-a-half-year-old project, this one, um, where it was about, yeah, uh, the emotions of sound. You go through the project, and I'm scared that the sound's actually going to happen here. Um, <laughs> Let me just see. There's like a baby crying, it's horrendous. <laughs> you, you basically get eight sounds and you can, you can say, okay, which, 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 what's my emotion? But you can see visually what's happening is like this, this morphic color stuff. And that was just a, an unused anomaly of basically getting this, um, okay, a color, a color range of zero to 360 degrees, which it is, is basically going through all of the different color ranges of something and rotating them in a, in a loop. It's as simple as that. This is simply a JPEG that's going through one line of CSS code to create that effect. Um, and again, at the time, it was like the whole project was based around this little piece of code at the start. Oh, let's, let's, like, let's get colors and flip them around and build a concept around, around that. Of course, the, the project itself was already there, but I think that the art direction was based upon the code itself rather than the normal thing, which is, a designer gets some, like a designer designs something, and then you think of the code later on. Um, where are we? Sorry, bear with me. Um, yeah. So these are just two examples of where I got like a small unused, not unused as such, but unused in the context of what it was being used as. Um, and playing about with them, just experimenting. But my problem at the time was that it's cool for me. It's cool for me, and it's cool for developers seeing it. And the project was doing quite well. It was like, you know, 2,000 likes on Facebook, that kind of thing. But it felt like there was this glass ceiling, because ultimately, the end user doesn't really care that much about, about how it's been done. Um, and so for me, it became a struggle of convincing people above me, OK, I think we should be. <coughs> I think we should be basically taking new bits of tech in CSS or or other other bits, like other things that are just new on the scene and might only use, or might only work in a couple of browsers. Um, but convincing people who are above you, or it might even be yourself who has to convince a client, who has to convince a boring person. They don't care because ultimately, like it's cool, sounds completely dangerous to me. Um, so this was a this was a real struggle for me throughout many years of kind of thinking. <coughs> I really believe in this taking taking the code first and building art direction around that to solve, to solve a, a, a problem of a brief. But then <coughs> I made a project um, as a personal project, which I'm going to go through shortly, which kind of changed how I felt about this. And it kind of gave me the answers to what I'd been looking for all along, which is why I think I'm going to try and, try and say this approach can be used um, and can get real good results. So basically, like I mentioned earlier on, for me, we are mainly completely bored of every aspect of our lives because we've just, ex for me, after your early 20s, you've just experienced everything. And this isn't, this isn't like a new thing. This is completely obvious. I totally understand that. But we've, we've completely experienced every single part of what we can have, mainly. So you go to a new, a new restaurant. OK, it's nice, but it's not like, it's not going to, unless, well, you have to spend stupid amount, a stupid amount of money to taste something that's completely, you've never tasted it before. Um, you remember when you were a child and you bought a, you got, you got a, you got a toy, that buzz, that, that feeling that you had, it was like, you can't make that now. It's impossible to get that inner child back. Um, and for me, like reaching, reaching what's new in us is, and, and reaching that inner child is kind of impossible. And the thing that I like to say about using this, this code stuff and bringing it into art direction is rather that Creating design and art direction is, uh, that, and trying to be new with it is basically comparing your work to 200 years or more of visual work. That's a freaking impossible thing to do. You can't, you can't compare to that. So if you take something that is inherently new, I think you've got a bigger chance of creating a piece that's actually unique, which to me connects to someone's inner child because we don't get it very often when, when you get something, when, you, when something new does happen to you, it's, it's not very often that that happens. And okay, okay, people don't care when they go on websites really that much. But I think you can connect to a small part of somebody. So just to <coughs> kind of analyze over those points, 
I think personally that fusing even the simplest, smallest technological anomaly or coincidence with complementary art direction basically abolishes the impossible struggle of coming up with unique visual art direction because the technology is already doing the work for you. You don't have to make, like a lot of interactive projects, that are huge, you know, huge uh, advertising pieces are so finessed. So, and, and I know that students at the moment are being taught like executional work. Does it, does it look new necessarily? Now, of course, there's amazing uh, advertising work out there that is new, you know, when it is experimental. But in the main, I think that a lot of the work that's being done at the moment, and especially when you look at the, s the French schools like Goblins, who they pump out amazing, uh, amazing students, but a lot of it's executional. And I personally think that's a little bit unhealthy. You need something that's unique, which is hard to come up with, but this gives a kind of route to that. And the the, uh, when you use this route, the execution is already new in its core, making the battle easy to reach a person's inner child. Um, <clears throat> and this is, this is another thing, like a lot of developers believe in designing in the browser, it's a constant fight between people. Okay, um, you know, more designers should be coding in the browser, like doing, getting their design in their head and then doing it directly in the browser. Okay, you can think that, that's fine. You know, nobody has to do something like to me uh, what, that someone tells them. There's so many different ways of, of doing things, so there's never one route. I don't like it when someone tells someone they need to be doing something in a certain way. But likewise, I personally believe that you can develop in the art direction. So for me, it's an interesting thing that whether, whether we're talking, uh, agency is built in a different way, uh, lots of different ways. Sometimes it's a case of art director, designer, maybe sometimes a concept of before the art director. To me, it's interesting to get code at the very core of that because you can get something that's unique from the very, very beginning of a project rather than trying to kind of pigeon, like pigeonhole uniqueness through trying to make something visually amazing, which is obviously a very, very hard task. And the consequence of doing it this way, to me, is this route can allow art direction and development to sing from the same hymn sheet and bleed the same blood throughout visual interactions and animations executed within, de within development. So basically, as a, as a consequence of that, I think that if you have something experimental at the very beginning of a project, things like interactions that are normally on a Photoshop layer, uh, sorry, layout, where it's like, okay, two button states, or what something's gonna be doing interactively is normally decided afterwards. If you put the, like, the actual core code stuff at the start, I think that stuff tends, tends to bleed into the rest of the work and feels, to me, more natural. There's a lot of amazing advertising work, um, big interactive projects that I see at the moment, which are really good in a lot of different areas, but do they, but it kind of feels like it doesn't kind of fuse with each other um, to me. It feels like there's a lot of talented people in different pockets doing an amazing job at their one thing. Um, and I think that's a constant struggle for agencies to get that like fusion between things. And to me, getting, using small snippets of like really unique code at the very core of a project so that it's wrapped around this unique thing can, can do that. Now I know that this probably, <laughs> Probably sounds like nonsense. I don't, I don't know. But like, um, now, now I'll take you through like the project that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about. <coughs> I will just say I was meant to be able to click these and then it would go to the website. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. Um, okay. So I think um, the pr the project that I mentioned really kind of showed me that, that w really showed me that all of those like kind of con conclusions that I got that um, that enable me to be able to tell a client now these are the reasons to use this thing not just it's cool but rather something more something a lot more meaty you know actual reasons in there um, whether it's correct or not I, I personally think it's correct but at least when you're talking to a client it sounds more confident than just saying. Okay, this is cool. Tech guys will love this. It'll go, it'll go viral on the scene. Mm, it's not big enough. So, <coughs> the the project that um, I'm going to go through is called In Pieces. It was a personal project um, done around a year and a half ago. So, what I will say in advance is like when I'm going through the code, don't necessarily take the code as the, the code is now a year and a half old, or in fact even two years old um, to be able to do it. So, this isn't necessarily about the like innovative code at the moment. If you did this now, okay, it's, it's nothing because that's, it's not new anymore. It's about the fact that at the time, nobody used it in this way. Um, so the project in, it, in terms of like the concept and what it does is um, essentially 30 endangered species um, who, yeah, they're endangered 
and they essentially fl like flow in and out of each other as an experience. But the key, the key throughout the piece is the fact that these 30 species are all very, very unique, um, unique species, um, which was a real like, important part of the project. So if, if I stick on like giant panda on here, or I don't know, rhino, <laughs> like, no, well, yeah, nobody's, like, everyone's seen those things before, everyone knows that. So you need, like, it was about educating people that, number one, there are actually these species, these really interesting species who exist, but also that they're endangered and you don't know about it. But it's a difficult task getting people to care about that. Um, so I did this project, which was 30 endangered species. Now, the key here, and I'll li link it back to like art direction, is that there's 30 individual uh, pieces that make up the 30 species. Um, and they are, <coughs> as an art directional form, um, polygon animals, which is not a new thing. But the, I'll, I'll show you the technology afterwards, which is the new thing, which gives it yeah, just a, a bit of an edge. Um, and as you flow through, um, yeah, each animal kind of, because yeah, it beautifully kind of morphs into the next one, which, which is a nice kind of thing, and everything's bright and bubbly, um, and it's and you'll notice like at the very beginning, nothing is really in your face. These are endangered. Like you, you need to do something about this now. It's all very bubbly, really light-hearted, um, to really like get users in. And then, if you choose to, on the side, say, what's the threat? Um, they burst into the different pieces um, and explain why they're endangered. You can take a look at some statistics about the animal, about the, about the, uh, the threat that, they've, that they're going through. You can also watch a video that comes up um, uh, like where you can see the actual, the actual animal. <coughs> Um, basically, that's it. It's essentially showing people that there's these endangered species, but the key being that there are 30 endangered species made out of 30 pieces. Um, there's a couple of little other things that you can do, like uh, you can view all of them at once and, and go through. There's a, little, a couple of little quirks in here as well, so I, I just displayed that. When, when you go to like a number 11 sloth, it goes extremely slow as an, anima as an animation because of sloths being slow. <coughs> there is, I'm trying to look for that one, yeah. Um, also, they each animate depending on what the animal is. Um, about half of them animate, so that like, for example, Fiji crested iguana, these are the real actual colors that happen to them. Um, so yeah, essentially it was it was just a project that was raising awareness of these of these species being endangered, um, and it was done as a personal project. And I never expected the kind of the kind of feedback that it would get. But the important thing that I'm talking through today is basically how it's done um, and what formed the project in the first place. So <coughs> this entire project came from um, a little little one line of CSS called um, WebKit Clip Path. Um, and at the time, well, no, and actually, as a fact, what WebKit Clip Path is, as the CSS property is for, is essentially so that if you have um, <coughs> a block of text, and you used to have in like weird, horrible-looking magazines where you'd have like a picture of this lamp here, and the picture of this other light over here, and you want to get like a block of text and kind of push it in between, that's what those things were for. That's the actual key use for uh, polygons to get like text and wrap it within a shape. Like, people shouldn't do that. I don't know why they invented it for that, but that's, that was the original purpose. And I remember at the time when it first came out, I looked at this and thought, oh my god, like, you can make shapes with CSS now. Remember, th remember that this is like two years ago now. So of course, there's things like SVG now that uh, can very nicely animate, um, it doesn't have the problems that it used to have. Of course, Canvas, uh, web uh, mainly Canvas. So shapes at the time were a really unique thing. And I remember looking at that and thinking, whoa, that's, that's freaking new. Um, and I remember just kind of coding it up and thinking, OK, what's, what's going to happen here? Um, just to get into a little kind of um, deep dive of what it actually is made of. Um, <coughs> it's essentially a, a list of coordinates. You can have however many points you like. Um, and what you see here is a triangle. Now, this, this represents in the, in the piece itself, every animal is made of 30 individual yeah, tr triangle pieces. Um, and each triangle is a set of three coordinates as a triangle. You could have four, you could have five, six, seven, or however many you want points to create a unique shape 
which is what I said before, it was about like getting text within a certain thing on a website. So here for an ex uh, like a really easy example, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, you can see that this is 25% along the X, um, zero on the top. Um, yeah, obviously this is halfway down, 50% and 100%, which is like vertical Y, um, and then 75% along the, along the top and zero to make up the, the ending triangle. Um, and what you're seeing when you see the animals like form together is essentially 30, 30 points, like 30, <laughs> 30 collections of, um, sorry, 30 collections of three points all dotted individually to create an animal. Um, and to go a little bit further, <coughs> just as an easier example is, you can see here the second example, uh, sorry, the second animal, Vaquita, um, <laughs> very exact percentages, but um, yeah. It's, you take like a rectangular div um, and the, the points are based on that, on that div by percentage. Um, you can make the parent however, however size you want. Um, and yeah, base the percentages on that. And then um, in terms of like coloring each one, what you're actually seeing when you, uh, when you see one of these triangles, so again, we've got this rectangle, just imagine the TV is the rectangle and we've got a triangle that's placed around over here. What a ma an amazing thing about clip path is, and I haven't really seen someone use this actually very well, is that all that color is, is actually a, it's a mask. It's a mask of a color that's the entire div. So the entire div itself um, is the color, and then it's masking an area of it. So let me just go back to the piece itself for just the context. All you're, s ooh, <laughs> sorry. Um, all you're seeing here is the yeah, 30 divs placed on top of one another, and each and every single one has a background color, a lot to it, and then, yeah, it's a, it's a masking area of three points, which, yeah. And inside that mask, you could put a picture in there, you can do whatever you like, which is an interesting thing. And, and like I say, when I was first playing about with this, it just seemed shocking that you could actually do this with what was meant to be locking type within a certain area. Um, and actually one of the first things that I, I, that I actually did with this was test. If I transition this with CSS, what's gonna happen? The fact that it moved really beautifully was really shocking to me. It was like, wow, why has nobody done this? So that's what really made up the project in the end. Um, to go a bit further. So the other, the other um, sorry, just reading this. <laughs> um, the other part that you'll notice here is just dot .crow. I, I apologize for any non-developers in here or people who aren't like savvy with CSS. I'm sorry. <laughs> we just don't know what's going on right now. But um, every single species, like the reason I say this, th this stuff is because I've been asked like a lot of the times, how has this been made? And people always assume like, oh, you did WebGL, you did Canvas. It's like, mate, I don't know any of those things. <laughs> like that's crazy code to me. This is super, super, super simple. And the whole point of what I'm trying to say is you can take something ridiculously simple and create something very, very innovative with it just because it's just come onto the scene. This shouldn't be new, but it is. It's an anomaly of what we can do because, like I said before, when you try and make something look different, that's a freaking hard task. But if you stick code at the, at the very bottom of it that nobody's kind of used before just because it's new, this shouldn't be innovative, but it is because of the context that it's in. Anyway, <laughs> so you'll notice every single... Uh, um, Th sorry, this is wrapped within something called dot .crow. Uh, all that is is a class that wraps the entire um, piece, uh, the entire kind of parent of the animals, and just it just changes a class. Um, and every single triangle is a thing inside one of these classes. Um, that just changes the polygon of here, for example, it's shard one, and there's 30 of these shards. Um, and it just changes the position with a root transition between, and <laughs> just, go into a bit of depth of what this is. Um, so on the base of all of the polygons to move between, you've got a base transition. That's all it is. I haven't sat there and gone, okay, after this amount of seconds, do this. After this amount of seconds, do this. It's just a base transition, but some using uh, SAS, SAS loops. Uh, of course, I'm sure that a lot of people in this room will know what that is, and these probably look really, really simple. But all this is doing is, if you take the 30 divs that are all wrapped within the same element it creates a mathematical equation of taking, um, so for example, S is the speed, T is the delay, and S takes, for example, 0 0.04 times the number that it is, plus 0.3. Let's forget about the 0.3 for a second. 
but it's 0 0.04, so the second one will be 0.08, the, the third one will be 0 0.0, uh, sorry, 0.12, <laughs> um, and the same goes for the delay, and that is what makes the um, transition go like one to the next. It's all mathematical, it's all kind of, it's to me very simple. Um, and like I said, like I said before, people ask, oh, is this a WebGL and stuff? No, it's just simple CSS, real simple CSS, where you're taking something that's not been used in that way, so it looks, yeah, it looks new to people. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the animations between one another, I'll just quickly uh, go back to the piece. <coughs> Let's get an interesting one, two seconds. Uh, I just wanted to get an interesting animation. So you'll see like this um, where, where, the, where the frogs kind of, in, I should know the technical name of that, the neck thing, the, the pocket, the pocket of its face, that is moving <laughs> in, a, in a certain way on a, on, in, a, in a loop. Um, and again, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, that, is that CSS animation? No, no, because CSS animations are, are terrible. And again, I apologize for anyone who doesn't you know what I'm talking about right now, but if you, if you use a CSS animation and then you break it halfway through, you're going to end up in a real, like, dry cut. Well, instead, what that is, is simply... Uh, all that is, is using JavaScript um, on the head and saying, okay, now you're state one, now you're state two, now you're state three. It just, again, just like, just like changing the animals itself from one animal to the next, it's literally saying, okay, go to this set of polygons go to this set of polygons, go to this set of polygons, all CSS, all using the transitions between to, um, to make the transitions and, of course, it loops. Um, and, yeah, there's, uh, like I showed in the actual piece, there's a couple of little anomalies that I like to place in there, um, such as the graphs here. Again, <coughs> this is something that it hadn't been, like, uh, graphs like this hadn't necessarily been all over the web, so it, was st it still looked kind of new, and it was so easy to create these. So, like, I've taken you through how a, a triangle is created based on a based on a rectangle. All you see here is a, is a square where the circle is, um, and a set of coordinates. Let's say, for instance, twenty percent. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe thirty-eight uh, percent uh, <laughs> x, um, ten percent down. Um, going between the, going between the different points um, to make up this graph. Um, and again, they use, oops, oh yeah, that's not the interactive version. <laughs> but they morph, they morph from one to the next. Um, and again, it was like just stretching, stretching what the actual core technology was to make something that looked new. Um, and I think little, little tiny bits like that just, yeah, added a, bit, a little bit of depth where even the graph like that hadn't necessarily been seen before. Um, and then, I don't want to like completely dig into every tiny little element of it, but one little decision from a, from a design point of view that I made um, that a lot of people didn't really like, but I still stick to this, um, is that there's two little icons down here that, that you can see. It's like a pie chart moving and a kind of square with a, with a line. One of the pieces of feedback that I received on the piece um, was that it's not really clear what they do. Not really, not really clear what they do. And I love that. I freaking love that because you're already engaged with this. And of course, maybe, maybe I'm allowed to do this because it's a personal project, but for me, that creates intrigue to me. Um, you know, people don't know what that's gonna be. To me, you don't always have to be super, super clear with, with what you're doing if it's not horrendously important. And then when you do, when you do click on them, um, well, one is the charts that I've shown you before, and one is <coughs> just simply that you can kind of download some desktops. It's not like an, ama like an amazingly important thing to the piece, but when you do, I think for me it switches the dynamic of the um, of the journey that they've taken to that button. If you stick there, download wallpaper, nobody clicks that button. If you click that button and wallpapers come up, to me it's like, ooh, wallpapers. That that to me is a very interesting kind of kind of thing. And I loved it when people said, ah, I don't know what that is. Great. <laughs> 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 uh, um, yeah, so I mean, essentially that's the piece. And there was there was a couple of little tiny things that you can uh, buy a poster and, and stuff like that. But the essential thing that I'm trying to get across in, in showing you this piece of work is this 
route that I've been talking about of essentially getting a piece of code at the very core and wrapping a project around it, um, which <sighs> is a really annoying tendency. Um, it's, I, I, don't, I just don't think it's a very particularly done thing. Um, and it does feel dangerous, but this is the project that really convinced me that actually it creates a certain, it creates a certain uh, connection between the different parts. I've said to a lot of people who've talked about this project um, or talked to me about the project that I do not believe the design to be particularly good. I do not believe the code certainly to be <laughs> particularly good. And I don't believe the, the music to be particularly good. You know, I think the elements in themselves are not that great, but like the connection between them because of this core thing that links everything to me is what really wraps it all up. And that's why I think, um, yeah, using code at the core can, can connect to a human being. And just, yeah, just go through some little stats. Um, over 4,000, I really should have like gone through and counted it, but I can't be bothered. <laughs> Uh, individual points actually plotted, including like the animations and stuff. And I must say that these points were individually clicked. These aren't like generated from some sort of weird thing. I had to make a JavaScript function. One, one. <laughs> what are you on about? Uh, <laughs> Top page views, 1.1 million page views, and zero spend on like yeah, budget and all that stuff. Um, that's not page views. That's uh, Facebook likes. Um, one experimental site of the year. Um, and I guess I can't show this other project. <laughs> there's, there, okay, there's another project which I released very recently, which shows like, basically getting a client project where it's nothing to do with uh, personal like um, gain, that you can use exactly this approach to actually uh, make a commercial piece of work. It had video within the letter forms. I'll I'll send the link like afterwards. You can see video like video within the letter forms, and the letter forms kind of like go from one to another. And a lot of people were like, okay, how is that done? And it's basically taking mixed blend mode, which is a thing in Photoshop. And this is the original state of the letter form. If you apply a screen to this layer with a video behind it, it creates that. And then if you create a screen of this entire wrapped layer, it creates what is essentially a mask of a letter form. Um, you know, you can also do this in things like SVG, but this is a pure CSS way of masking stuff using completely a mixed blend mode to mask stuff. That's, that's to me, what an art director knows or, or a designer knows because they're used to Photoshop. And when, when they see, OK, this has just become available in CSS, I think that connection can be made and been brought, be brought into the, the actual focus of a project. So in, in conclusion, um, to me, experimentation in young designers is essential to building their breadth of knowledge and abilities to, for given future tasks for the context that they need to know, but it, it requires reason at the end of it. And art directors and designers need not necessarily code, which is one argument, but investigating the new code techniques that are available is a way of planting newness at the very core of a creative concept, resulting in highly experimental but thought through conceptually centered digital experiences at the very core of the piece of work. Um, thank you. <laughs> Sorry? 4,000 points individually plotted for the animals? More than 4,000, or less. Plus, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, basically, the, the, um, the actual JavaScript function that was used to do that was essentially take, take a rectangle, just like the uh, polygons were created from. Um, it's actually on, a, on an article. You can check it out on Smashing Mag. Um, it goes into like depth of the actual code that was used. But it essentially, I was able to get my illustration, which was from Illustrator originally. Like Every single one was illustrated first to make them look good. If you, if you just code that from scratch, it's going to look terrible t to me. Um, you need to get all the colors right. And then you get the picture. And if you like um, click if in the browser, I made a JavaScript function where you click on some area of this picture, and it would basically sp spit me out where in the context of the rectangle I had clicked, just using like, OK, where's your mouse compared to like the top of the screen? Where is the rectangle? Compare these two things. And then where am I? Compared to the size of this, yeah, all that stuff. Um, but like, yeah, so I did that, like, and after three clicks, it would spit me out what the triangle was. Um, and that's, that's what would make up the actual code that I could use. But even after then, like, I had to individually 
um, get the actual points. So we're talking like 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 1, um, difference between things to, uh, I, I'm sure everyone in this room who's been on Photoshop or Illustrator knows that if you get like two objects and sit them next to each other completely, you're gonna get this strange like anti-aliasing like between the shapes, it's super annoying. So every single shape then had to, in Chrome, be kind of overlapped with each other very, very carefully. Um, otherwise you'd see the color like beneath. Um, so it was, it was pretty intense to, yeah, it was pretty intense to make the shapes. Okay. Uh, what I know is that ICT designers and developers are very keen on trying new things. Uh huh. Yeah. But what you just told me that young developers are a bit uh, like to say the secure side. Uh huh. So what, why do you think they, they, they don't like to take the risk? Because you obviously take, you take something very simple. Yeah. Take To me, actually, I was, I was more alluding to designers, actually, rather than uh, developers. I think developers do tend to like to try new things. Um, I th actually, I, sorry, I, was, I, I meant to refer to designers. I see a lot of designers coming out of, um, yeah, coming out of schools and stuff, and it seems like their work's quite locked in um, to styles. It looks experimental, but it's not. It's basically taking con contextual styles of what's the, the, to me, of course, you have stunning, amazing like people who come out of these places, but in the main, a lot of the work that I see is basically taking trend stuff. Um, that's not dangerous to me. But developers, developers do like to try new things. But I think where the breakdown is is that a lot of the time, like designers and art directors are the, ultimately the people who decide things at the core of a project. To me, and to m like, I don't think developers necessarily always. You know, I'm sure there'll, there'll be companies out there who do um, make this possible. But developers don't tend to be at the start of the argument. They're not normally involved in client stuff. So they tend to get something on their table, develop this. Um, and to me, the interesting thing is taking the knowledge of what a coder has. And actually, a lot of it is to do with the, the relationship as well, which is always a hard thing. It's becoming better, but I still think there's a huge breakdown between like a design team and a developer team. Like the, cr the, the cut between them is quite, sorry. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it depends on the it depends on the designer, but of course they have much more responsibility. But it, to me, it's to me okay. A designer a designer can try to um, come up with a style that looks different compared to what's out there. But it's pretty hard to do that to me. It's pretty hard to make something that looks different at the core because, like I said before, you're comparing yourself to two hundred years of visual design. Okay, it's not web. Okay, the animations weren't there. But to me. Um, the interesting thing, um, I say this to friends sometimes, the interesting thing to me is, you imagine, I don't know if anyone in this room knows um, the work of Peter Saville for uh, um, a Factory Records. Like they used to do like these, yeah, th these covers for bands like Joy Division, um, and not necessarily Joy, the Joy Division album covers, but Peter Saville did some work which was like geometrical shapes. Um, and to me it's like, imagine taking the, the Bauhaus movement away <laughs> from from context and his work being out there, people are like, whoa, holy shit, like that's amazing. And for me now, what's happening is that we had Flash for years and years and years, and this is where the technology part of it comes in, in terms of visual stuff is harder to do than the, te than the technical stuff itself. Like Flash ha was there, and it was comp completely forgotten about. Like people have like thrown it in the bin over here, and actually people have also forgotten about this work. And we're now in this position where I think it's really, really easy to take um, a coding-based like execution and throw it in the in, throw it into the creative mix because yeah because we this is a very unique proposition that we have right now. Making something visual as a designer is pretty hard to come up with. Yeah, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like old now. <laughs> it's real old. Did you get the specific information about the animals from? It was. Did you collaborate with an NGO or something? Or Sorry? Did you collaborate with an NGO or something? No, so like two parts of that question is number one, it was really hard. Like I said early on when I was going through the piece, um, it's specifically really unknown or interesting species, whether they look interesting 
Um, I didn't go through all of them, but there's like loads of different like interesting species in there that people don't necessarily know about. Um, and what comes in tow with that is that you don't have as much information as, it, as if you put into Wikipedia, I don't know, uh, uh, what's the rhino that's really endangered that everyone knows about? I can't remember. Should know that really. <laughs> but, but like uh, the specific rhino was like Sumatran rhino, for instance, instead of just that other one. Um, uh, so the information was really hard to come by, and it was from a, ver a variety of sources. Actually, in the piece, there's like a little sources tab that <coughs> goes down all the different sources that were that were used in the in the project. But yeah, it was it was just taken from numerous sources. A couple of them were like really hard, and and a, yeah, a couple of times there was so little information. There was like an amazing looking animal, and I'd actually illustrated it, and it would look good. And then it's like, oh god, there's no information. You can't yeah. use that. There's like you just can't use that. Um, and it was also the same vice versa that oh that great information super interesting species and then you'd then you'd put it on as an illustration and let's say it's for example like uh, I don't know it wasn't this but imagine that you uh, put an uh, put an animal that was basically a ball that looks rubbish <laughs> as polygons like you need something unique in there so yeah anyway to the, um, on the second part of your question um, a couple of people said to me oh why don't you actually like work with uh, uh, WWF was one of the people who, uh, one of the ones that people mentioned, or another animal, animal institution. And there is actually one that, like, every time the poster gets sold, like, money, it, like, goes to the, the this London Zoo uh, specific trust. Um, but it wasn't like, in, in, it wasn't in cohesion with them. And one of the interesting things that I th think about the project as a as a personal project, I'd say like this goes out to all personal projects. So many people said. Why don't you contact WF? They'd be all over that. They'd be all over that. And actually, they did contact afterwards. They, they actually met them in London to talk about future stuff. It never materialized into anything. <laughs> it never materialized into anything. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a conversation that we had afterwards. That my reason, and I stick to this, is that as a personal project, if I stick WF on there, yeah, I know. Is that going to fucking sting me? I'm like, I don't know what that is. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, get in there, mate. Come on. Get in the screen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is all part of it. <laughs> yeah. My point was going to be like, uh, basically, if you stick WF in that corner to me, if you stick if you stick WF in the corner, I think people can read a piece of advertising. And this is this is obviously a big problem for advertising pieces because you can't get around that. But I think a big reason for maybe half of its success is the fact that you go on it and it's not trying to push something on you straight away. It's like literally just saying, here are the animals, peruse them at your heart's content, and then afterwards, if you want to find out more, then we're going to tell you why this is endangered. And we're not going to shoot, we're not going to like throw any kind of spiel at you. We're not going to say, come on, save the animals, mate, or anything like that. It's just, here's the information. And I think personally, you, stick, you, you put a, a partner on that, it kind of kills some of the... Um, Kill some of the grand grandiose, uh, or, or sorry, the results. It could be argued either way, of course, as well. That like you put WF on there, it's like whoa, big campaign. But I don't know. I I think, yeah, not using a partner actually worked for its for its failure. I think. Um, yeah. Does that answer the sure. question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering. You showed some like transition from one animal to another. Yeah. Uh, but they were like super sequential from. Yeah. So I mean, I didn't know how far to like kind of jump into it because things can get a little bit boring after a while. But there is a button over here. Um, this is all pieces. Um, I also do think like there's always this like kind of argument of, and I I use this as well. Like everything being a top nav. Like let's just stick everything in a top nav. And maybe this is the joy of doing something as a personal project that you can just kind of experiment with things. But I don't know. There's, there's almost like a curiosity to it. I think that you that you find things yourself. That's what the that's what the whole premise is about. I said before, like you just find the information on on your own. So yeah. Anyway, on the on the left hand side, you can uh, click to all the species, or you can randomize between each one, which basically goes yeah, fourteen, twenty five. Um, that's a terrible one. Don't go on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, because uh, I was just wondering about the presentation. So it was always like. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's it's all just like based on the actual like the core um, the core sequence, which is 
yeah, based on the based on the number out of one to thirty using one, two, three, four, five times. I think it was zero point zero four. Yeah. Um, also, the other the other thing about this is that um, I'll just quickly demonstrate. This is like there is actually two sequence uh, formulas in there. You notice that if you go right, sorry, if I go right, the polygons go to there. But if I go left again, it does go from the other side. And that's there's just two sequences on the go. One's like okay, one. T uh, sorry, the number times blah, 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 blah. And if you're going the other way, it reads that and says, okay, 31 minus the amount times the thing, which, which gives you the, the backwards motion. Um, is, there, is that kind of? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would better understand it. Slightly. Cool. Slightly. Yeah. yeah, one more. Yep, that's cool. Uh, I have a question. I'm also a front end developer, so I know the. Yeah, you're looking at this thinking, what is that? It's fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my potty mouth, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I was curious, how much time did you spend on actually uh, writing the code for backwards compatibility for browsers that don't actually... <laughs> 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 Who cares? Come on. No, um, <laughs> no. Okay, so two things. Is Number one is, well, the first question was like, how long did everything take? Five months is how long it took of my own time. And actually, at the time... Um, I was working on a big project at Media Monks, the barbecue thing, I don't know if you saw it, but like, it was like in a really intense project, so I was like sneaky. Oh God, it's on camera. Sorry, Media Monks, <laughs> but um, I, was like I was like sneaking out at uh, lunch times just to do this, like in my own time, like for half an hour in Starbucks across the road in Hilversum, like sn sneaking out there. That was like five months of like just intense horribleness. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, five months and, what was the other question, sorry? Yeah, for like a browser. Yeah, yeah. yeah, browser, yeah. browser. So, um, <laughs> so first off, um, at the time, the, I mean, at the time and also now, it was only compatible for um, WebKit. But that's split into two things. Number one is that at the time, Firefox did not support clip path. As a, so that obviously, the core CSS isn't like dash WebKit clip path. It's actually clip path. But at the time, it didn't work. So it's pointless putting that there. I think now it might work. Um, and I actually got contacted by Firefox about that, um, which I need to sort out at some, some stage if it works. Um, but also the other side of it for me is that maybe it's another joy of doing a personal project, um, although I think the numbers don't lie personally, that um, it works on mobile completely. And I think that's a massive thing. Like, I think uh, I had a friend who was like, okay, this is cool, yeah, this is gonna be rubbish on here. Whoa, okay, this actually works. If it didn't work on there, I think, yeah, you've really got to question technology and whether it's okay. But of course, it, it, w it works backwards. It's just image-based on other browsers. It's not like it doesn't work. It's not like the, um, the core message isn't there. And I think that's actually really a core thing about this, um, like an argument between like using the little core technologies that come new on the scene. Quite often, they don't work in things like IE and Firefox, and that's a big problem. And I think it's always a big argument. And like I said before, when I was doing these projects before, it was okay, this is risky and it doesn't work in these browsers, so how can you say this is a good thing to do? But then when you have 1.1 million views of something, that changes everything. It's like, okay, people are mainly using these browsers or on a phone, um, but also if, you, if the key point is there, then you're not destroying it. It's not like they get to it and think, ah, they, they don't get angry, they're just going to look at it, you know? Um, so, yeah. But it didn't, it didn't take me very long to backwards compatibility because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just made it work. <laughs> made it work. There's pictures. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. If you worked on it for five months and then every single minute you had that uh, you worked on it, yeah. how, how about your social life then? <laughs> 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 no, no, um, no, uh, well, I mean, you don't have to be outside to drink beer, do you? Come on. It's, uh, <laughs> nah, um, Good question. <laughs> nah, um, I think that's no, that's all. To, <laughs> fuck, I have no answer to that. Like, uh, shit, I really have no answer. To that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, like, yeah, of course you have like some sort of social life, but you just fit things between it, I guess. Um, it is difficult. It is. Dif I would say it was a difficult time. Like, um, it was especially difficult after about two months, I think, because. After about two months, you know, you invest so much time, 
And of course it creates strain on your life, your relationships with people, um, which is very, very difficult. And after two months, you're looking at this half-baked thing thinking, what on earth am I doing with my life? I mean, literally, what am I doing? Um, and I think, I don't know what really possessed me to keep going with it, really. I think it got to a certain point when you saw you, you're too far over the line not to finish it. Um, and uh, in the end, it was a, like a mad rush to meet this deadline that was like the 17th of March. And you can see in some of the really terrible ones, <laughs> which are, wait a second, let me find that. I love this, I do like the tongue. I'm sorry to praise my own work, but I love that tongue. Like seriously, check out the sun bear. It's freaking amazing. <laughs> it's got a mental tongue. Um, yeah, like the camels, oops, sorry. Uh, where is it? Yeah, like the camel really hit the camel. That was like in the last days of like, oh, come on, just get it down. <laughs> and those are the ones that I kind of hate. But um, anyway, yeah, I, yeah, no social life. So yeah, that's that's the answer. Who, need, right. who needs who needs that? Priorities. Yep. Thank you very much. We're yep. Sorry, I'm going to stop this uh, the, the question here. Yep. We're going to have a. <laughs>
so close. Welcome back, everyone. For a short, short, efficient break. Anouk? Hoi. <laughs> okay, do my thing. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Anouk van der Zanden and I work here at DPDK as an art director. Uh, does anyone know what we do here at DPDK? Yeah? <laughs> can you tell us? Can you tell us? No, what we do here is uh, we are a, a creative digital agency, a full service, so we do everything. We come up with the concept, we, we create it and then we build it. So that's, that's practically what we do. Um, my talk is about art directors anecdotes. Um, it, it's, I'm not going to talk about uh, like a, a project from A to Z. Um, it's, it's more about stuff I really liked about projects. And um, so, well, that's what it is. Uh, art director, what does an art director do? Um, I think in every agency that's completely different. So I can only tell you what I do here. And for me, working here at DPDK as an art director is still designing a lot of shit. Just, uh, I, I do a lot of designs for a lot of projects and I think it's really important um, to, to just keep yourself updated in this digital world, just to just, just stay designing and yeah, so that's what I do. And um, uh, what I also think an art director does is they, they have a vision on the project, they are really the storyteller, they have to make smart decisions and sometimes be the bitch and I can be the bitch. Um, but most important maybe is to really listen to your team. Um, in, the, in the announcements already was something like uh, um, I have really a an, an, uh, show me kind of approach. Well, that's really what I believe in. Um, it's, it's for me, it's never like um, maybe back in the days it was more like, okay, there's a concept and there's a design and then, okay, developer, just build this. Now, it's not, it's not how I work. Um, I really um, like to talk to my team and then and maybe I have already an idea and then they, they uh, uh, mostly the, like the developers, I, I don't know anything about code. Can you just tell me what you can do? Yeah, show me what you can do and then we can take it from there. So I think it's really important to, to, to have an open mind as an, uh, as an art director. Flash, woohoo! Who uh, has uh, worked with Flash? <laughs> Yay, me too. <laughs> when I started working here at DPDK almost 10 years ago, so it was quite a long time, uh, I was a Flash designer. And then, yeah, we all know what happened. That was quite of a downfall. Um, for me, that was a really rough period, because uh, after that, I heard a lot of, well, that's not possible, we cannot do that. And I was really used to designing and already thinking in, an, in animation. So that for, for a long time, that wasn't really happening. But we're back. There are so many great, cool new techniques that we can use and I think everything is possible now. For instance, VR, WebGL, CoPens, Canvas, and even the HoloLens, we have one here. So if anyone wants to try it, maybe we can arrange that. Um, so I still design a lot. And I do that in Photoshop, still in Photoshop. But um, when I'm designing, for instance, a website, um, you, it, it's not only the design, it's maybe 50% the motion. But when you're designing, it's you're, you're actually just designing an image. It's not moving. Well, it's moving in my head already, but it's not moving. So how can I probably tell the front-end developer, what can you do? How, how do I want, want this to look? And can you show me what you can do? So what we do here at, at DPDK, we do a lot of prototyping um, in, in, in very different ways. Um, to, to do the prototyping, you already see what the U, UX potential can be uh, and you can show it to the client and it always really works as a wow effect because they immediately see, well, this could, our, our website, our product could look like this. So that, that works really well. Um, but for me, prototyping is most important to inspire the developers. Because um, it's, uh, well, I have, what I always say here at DPDK, I say it a lot, ik zet altijd hoog in, 
just always aim high. So when we do prototypes, um, and we do a lot of prototypes in After Effects, so we do a lot of uh, interface prototypes, I sometimes already know that our, our, there are animations in there that are not doable, like plane-wise or budget-wise, but that's, that's not really important because when I show, when we show to the developer, it's not, it should look exactly like this. It's more like, okay, uh, uh, can you do something like this? It's an indicator. It's to keep the developer sharp and to, to let them come up with m maybe even better ideas. So this is one prototype we did for uh, Oasa. It's a website, uh, uh, we did it for a company, a water company. Um, we, we did uh, a new design, new uh, uh, um, uh, uh, wireframing, and we also uh, thought, well, what can we do? It's about water, what can we do for the, the whole uh, uh, motion vision? And we wanted to do something with the water team. So um, we were thinking, yeah, well, how can we talk to the, to the developer and say we want something like this? That's really hard. So what we did was we, we prototyped the design uh, with After Effects, and we really focused on all the transitions, and we focused on more like um, uh, rollover animations and stuff. So this was really helpful for how it eventually looked. I guess we will be going live with it in a few weeks. I don't know. Monday. With an update on Monday. So if you check it out then, you, you will see what eventually it, it it's, uh, would look like now in the, in the website. Okay. When I start a project, I think it's really important to, to do a lot of research. So, um, uh, yeah, well, to get inspired. And what I do is I, I visit um, all the award websites. There are a lot of great websites on there because they're all winners. And if you yeah, just, just browse through them, just view everything. Even when you're working on a project and you see, see a website and you think, well, this is not really what I'm looking for. But there always can be a small detail that you think, well, this is really cool and I can do something with that. So for me, that's really the way to go. Uh, I do a lot of online judging. I, I am an online judge for the FWA. And that's, that's even better because the products you see there are, well, they're just online. They're brand new. So probably going to see even more stuff, even better stuff, more new stuff. So that's really helpful for me. And get your inspirations by your team uh, to talk to your team members because there, there's already so much knowledge within, in DPDK within that team. And if you share your ideas with that, I think that's really uh, powerful. Okay, projects. Um, I'm going to talk about two projects. I'm not going to, what I already was saying, talk about it from A to Z, but more show you how we started, what it, what it became, and what uh, were the, the problems or, and the solutions. So what I want to talk about is DS Signature Art. Um, has anyone seen this project? Nobody? <laughs> Only people from DPDK? Okay, well, um, uh, it's a project we did, uh, um, I think, a year ago. And I did, uh, for this project, the design and the, the art direction. Um, DS Signature Art, uh, it was for DS Automobile, so for it was for a car brand. And it was for the NFF, and that's the film festival in uh, Utrecht. And they hand out every year the Gouden Calvre. So um, we wanted to include that in, in the experience. So we, uh, we, had a, uh, we had a lot of ideas. And then we, we, uh, we showed it to the client in, in a pitch presentation. And they were like, yeah, meh, it's not really what we're looking for. So there, there were probably two too commercial, and they were more looking for something avant-garde. So, well, okay, that can happen. And in that same meeting, we showed them this. And this is something we found on the internet. It's a code pen. It was just when we were doing the research on and, and, and finding the, the inspiration. And we, we, well, if you ask me, it's really ugly. It's not really, <laughs> yeah, really that appealing. So. I have no idea. Just cubes with with, uh, with texture on it from cities or something. It, it's, yeah. But we already thought, well, this this is this is a cool technique. Maybe we can do something with it. And the client really loved it. 
So it was really in this, in this pitch, in this presentation, in this project, really a game changer. And it, it was a new starting point for us. So we went from here and made new concepts. Um, so this, this project for me was maybe this is the best ex example of a project we created all together. So it was never like I made all the designs or I, uh, well, I did a lot of design stuff. I made the logo. I uh, worked on the storyline. I, I created the whole vibe, like how it could look. But we did, again, a lot of prototyping. And in this project, we did not really do that on how it would look, but more on which techniques we could use. Um, and after that, on how it could look. But in, at first, it was always about the technique. This is a prototype um, our motion designer, uh, Joris, uh, did. Um, we were thinking about the gouden calf. And we were saying, OK, uh, what can we do with that? And we, uh, we have, uh, were seeing the blocks. And maybe we could do something with, with those blocks. And, and uh, yours just found an app and took some pictures of this dog that I have on my desk. And um, a, a few hours later, there was this prototype. And I already think it's really cool. And, and that, that's, that's more, I, I did not come up with this. I, I, as a designer, I did, not, I did not say, OK, you should make this. It was just, it was there. And then, OK, what can we do now? It's, it's not a calf. It's, uh, it's a dog. But I could already see what we could do with it. So, well, this is this is the <laughs> the thing on my desk. I bought it at the flea market as a joke for for a colleague, but now it's 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 a prototype. So this is another prototype, one of many many prototypes. Um, well, you can already see. Okay, this this is already the shape. What yeah, what, what can we do with it uh, concept wise? So we're working on that, and this is the final result in in the, the experience. It was really, yeah, well, uh, I think it looks beautiful. And what's really funny about this, when we were working on the project, it, it was not, in, at first we thought we'd, we should do something with this, but in the end, it wasn't even a big part of the whole project. It was just, okay, there was a transition to this calf, and then you go to, to another page or something. So, yeah, I really like that, that we did so many prototypes, and we did not know where it would end up. Um, in the end, the project was about that you could sign the project, so you could, could uh, um, uh, put your, your autograph in the, in the experience, and then we would transform it to, um, uh, well, an interactive, beautiful uh, art piece. So you could move around, you can zoom into it. Um, and this is the intro we did on that. Um, there's, uh, I don't think there's sound. There's no sound. Well. Maybe you should just go to the website because it's still online. And and this well, this is for me the, what what it's all about. It it looks <coughs> super cool. Uh, it's about the technique. It's about uh, the design I did. So it all comes together. And I don't know if we can see it all. It does. Okay. So well, this is really cool. The logo. I made a logo, and then <laughs> yours said, "Well, uh, give it to me." And then, then, and, and then he, he made this that that the logo would appear with all those those particles. It was not something I told him, but and then I said, "Whoa, this is super cool! Can we do something else with it?" And so that's, uh, that's what we did. And, and well, now you see here, this is the starting point, and this is the end result. And we did, yeah. So this it was never like we know everything already. Never. It was just working on it, making more designs, throwing things out, having new ideas, and do really uh, a lot of cool technical stuff. For me, this project is one of my favorite, well, it's my favorite project I ever did, um, because everything came together in the end. So there was a really cool sound experience made by our uh, sound designer. Um, we had a, we our sound designer, we had a, there, Dicky. We had a, an installation uh, on the film festival, and it, you, you could write the, your signature in the air, and it would work with uh, mo uh, Leap Motion. Uh, so that was really cool. And it, it, the, yeah, my team, it was th they were so talented. And yeah, everyone knew exactly what they could do, and I knew exactly what they could do, and it was just all came, it, it all just came together. 
and it got now it it was a um, it was a Webby nominee in the category best art direction. So you can probably imagine <laughs> that is really <laughs> cool for me. <laughs> okay, funny fact. Uh, well, it was about a car, but we never put a car in the whole experience. Only in the intro we have parts of it, but there's never a whole car, and it's only in the intro. So for me, in the end, it, it wasn't really about doing something for a car, it was doing something for a brand. And, and yeah, well, I think that's really cool that the client uh, believed in that too. So another project, we're working on it right now, so this is going to be really like a sneak preview for you, um, is for, uh, for a brand, Russell & Co. Um, Russell & Co, it's a new soda brand, it's by Frumona. And it's a product range with three sodas, a bitter lemon, a tonic, and a ginger ale. Um, the concept is really, really simple. It's a cocktail mixer. That's it. Uh, the client loved it. They were really happy. And the, the for us, the challenge was how can we build this into a great experience? So you can, you can make a cocktail mixer, but how can you make it super awesome? No surprise. Prototyping. We started prototyping and we had always in mind, okay, it should work on mobile. Because the scenario was, you, you have it on your mobile, you add a bar, you, you start mixing and you can, you, you can order your drink at the bar. Um, and we always kept in mind, okay, it should, be, it should look really, really delicious. So that, that was uh, the starting point for this project. Well, even before we did designs, we were working on uh, the prototypes and we started out with Course types in 3D, because we thought, that's really cool. Well, it is really cool. You can, can have a really realistic feel, and it looks super clean, and you have, yeah, you have a lot of control how it looks. And uh, the idea was to use those 3D models into WebGL, so the cocktail could be interactive. So you could zoom into it, or you could move around it. And this is one of the prototypes. It's all made in 3D. Um, you can see, well, it, it looks quite cool. It's, it's pretty, it's super clean, it could work. Well, it didn't. Because <laughs> when we were doing this, okay, it's going to be really time consuming to make all those models to, to really work in, in the details and to, to render it all. It, it was just too much. And we were already making some, some prototypes on how can we use this in WebGL performance issues, it was really no-go on mobile. So we thought, okay, this, this maybe we should do something completely different. And then we thought, okay, maybe we can do it in video, just all video. Uh, again, really realistic, and you don't have to create it, you can just buy the stuff. So the garnishments and the liquors and the liquids, you can just buy it. And it's really easy to prototype, because yeah, everyone can build a, a simple studio with some lights and, and some, uh, some assets. And, and, and this is one of the prototypes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fail. It's, <laughs> it's not really working. You, you can already see, OK, um, we, we had no control on, on the liquids. We had no control on the garnishments. You can see the, this is not really looking that appealing. And yeah, we had no, no uh, control on the shadows. And, 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 and we saw more and more stuff that was not really not working. So uh, probably no go. And we were thinking, OK, we want to make a lot of cocktails. So there should be a, a possibility to make a lot of combinations with a lot of garnishments and, and liquors and whatever. Um, so we would have shoot a lot of videos. And by a lot, I mean a lot. And that was really time consuming, wasn't really happening. And we're still on mobile, you should load a lot of data. It would, uh, long loading times. And as you can see in a prototype, it got messy really fast. So what then? Still mobile is really important. It's still, it, it should look really, really delicious. And um, the combinations were really important. Uh, and the performance. So what can we do then? And, and then we were, were brainstorming in the team and saying, well, okay, 3D is really cool, maybe. 
2D. Maybe you can do keep it just keep it really simple and and do it in 2D. And it was uh, it took a, quite a long time in the team that because we were were discussing it uh, and 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 brainstorming about it. And it took it took a while that it but when it we were having still the 3D mindset like. Uh, 2D, 3D, it wasn't really working. And then it clicked and then it was, okay, but then we can do this and this and this and this and this. For instance, we could do something with real physics or we could do something with, with blend modes or with uh, uh, canvas or with m multiple canvases. So um, everyone thought, well, this, this is really maybe the way to go. And we could make it that there were never any combinations. So Again, cool, and it's quite easy to prototype. Well, that's, that's easy for me to say, because it's, it's all in code. This is a prototype uh, we did in, a, in a still in After Effects. This is, again, just to show the developer how it could look. Um, well, we thought, oh, this, this, is, this is working. We, uh, we, wa we could work with this. Um, and then we started prototyping. And we were asking for really, really ugly prototypes because we were thinking, okay, we, we need to focus on the technique. So don't focus on how it should look because, because meanwhile, I already made a lot of designs and, and we all, the whole team, already knew how it would look. So it was the focus really on the technique and so we asked specifically for really ugly prototypes. So one of the really ugly prototypes did. This is already quite... And with the assets we, we, we wanted to use, but yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just really <laughs> stupid and buggy, and, but it doesn't matter. We, we, the whole team could already see, well, this could work. This could really, really be super nice. And, and if you see this, then, well, you can come up with, with so many new ideas. And well, that's what we did. And there were a lot of frustrations for me as an art director. Because, okay, I already knew how it would look, everyone knew how it would, would look, but it was, this project was really uh, a, a technical challenge. So for an art director, I could not really do stuff. It was just, okay, I just wanna see stuff, I wanna uh, um, have new ideas, and uh, so what can I do then in this project? It took a really long time. So when I, when I was, uh, brainstorm with the team. I heard a lot of, well, we can do that, but it will take too much time, and it's that, uh, so we cannot do it. And then you, the only thing you can do is make smart decisions, just to say, okay, let's just skip this. We're gonna do it totally different. Uh, but always keep the, the concept in mind. Always have focus on the concept. concept. We, we did a lot of concessions, but never on a concept. So for me, that was really important, and again, Really, ik zet altijd hoog in. Really aim high, but also be really flexible. Because you can say, well, I, I really want this, and I please, can you do this? And But yeah, well, if, if it's not happening, then it's not happening. So you, you need to be flexible. And for me, really important is to ask a lot of questions. Because when someone says to me, well, it's, it's not possible, or I cannot do this in, in the amount of time we have, then I want to know exactly why that's not happening. Because then I can, can help as an art director. If I don't know, then it's okay, well, I'll just uh, carry on. No, I just want to know exactly what, what's, uh, what's happening and then come up with new, uh, new concepts and new ideas. So those frustrations, there are maybe a bit negative. And I can imagine that is quite hard for the team when, some, yeah, when it's, it's not really coming together and it takes a lot of time. But it comes from something positive. It comes from you want to make it better, that you, uh, that you that, and you know that you can make it better. You, you've seen stuff on, online, and you know if we could put this in, then it would look, look even better. So the negative comes from a positive. Um, yeah, let it go. <laughs> For me, that's really hard in these kind of projects. It's it's because yeah, well, it's it's some. There were parts that I, I looked at at the at the experience, and I thought, well. I can only see the stuff that's not in there. Huh? We, we, we come up with this and this and this, and then it's not in there, and yeah, what then? So to let, then, to let that go, like, okay, well, it is cool. You cannot really say that. And for me, the, the, the turning point 
came when the client saw it. They came here at the office and they looked at it and, and they, they uh, played it with on their laptops and on their mobiles. And they were just amazed. They're like, oh, this is super cool that, that you can build this. This is really awesome. So for me then it was, okay, maybe it is awesome. And then I could just let it go for a while, I guess. <laughs> Because we were just still we were still working on it. This is a screen capture of the uh, of the cocktail mixer. Um, it w it needs still needs some tweaking, but um, so this is really a sneak preview because it's not online yet. Um, so you can choose your your Russell drink, and we did something with sliders. So the idea was that you really can s slide your your garnishment or your ice in into the glass. Um, and there comes the liquor. And then you can choose your, your garnishments. So you could make yeah, really uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different combinations. And then we would top it off with the Russell stirring stick and then the Russell would uh, be in there. And then you could name the cocktail and then you can share it. And and um, even the sharing uh, was really uh, a, a challenge because because of the techniques we used, um, it was not possible to to create a cocktail and then make a screenshot and then save it as an image because we really wanted to share that that people would share their cocktail, for instance, on Facebook, and really to see what cocktail they created, but that that was not possible for a long time. And so eventually we said, okay then let's make all the cocktails in Photoshop. So we did all these cocktails in Photoshop. <laughs> and uh, it probably looks like it took a lot of time. It, well, it did, but not that much time because we had a really good plan. <coughs> like we, we, uh, we numbered every cocktail. We knew exactly what we were doing. So it, I don't know, it took maybe a day or something. But we have uh, every cocktail uh, you can build in the, in the cocktail mixer. So that was my talk. Yay. <laughs> well, we, um, Antoine already told you about the next meetup. Again, um, it's going to be on motion and creative coding. Um, and we were looking for a really cool uh, talk. So um, yeah, again, two, the three talks uh, here at DPDK Barbecue Cold Beers. So I hope to see you again soon. It's going to be 22nd. next month, 22nd. So it's, uh, it's going to be quite soon. Um, thank you. And are there any questions? <laughs> I have one. Um, so for the cocktail mixer, yeah? um, how long did it take you to make the entire project? Because there was a lot of prototyping with 3D duty. Uh, how long it took us to make it? The cocktail mixer. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, it took months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took a lot. Of, yeah, it took a long time. <coughs> yeah. Just a couple months. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, if, if you would say uh, day and night. <laughs> 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 yeah, something like that. Okay, are there any other questions? So yes. Was, was the client uh, satisfied with the results? <laughs> They were really satisfied <laughs> with the results. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was, was saying. That that when they saw the, the 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 cocktail mixer really working and really it looked already really cool and with all the physics and stuff and it worked on mobile, um, they were just like, okay, this is really cool and they were just looking at each other like, oh, this is really cool that we can get this and uh, yeah, so they were really happy. Yes. Uh, in terms of the uh, creative uh, hierarchy, what is the role of the creative, creative director in uh, such projects? I mean, uh, is he the first one to pick up the project or to brief it to you to, to do it together? Or? Yeah, the, the creative director here um, is, is, more, uh, is, is more doing like concept stuff and more doing like uh, the, the pitch uh, presentations. And then uh, we work yeah, together, like what we can do. And I'm more on focusing on the design and on the experience. So that's, that's actually <coughs> the difference. But there's a lot of overlap, like art direction-wise and uh, 
Okay? No more questions? Then I think we can get our cold beers then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.